Good evening. Welcome to the Spiritual But Not Religious show. I'm your host, George Lewis. We have a great guest tonight with a really super topic that speaks to every one of us and has a message of uh, real transformation in, in, in ways that affect all of us. Uh, I'm sure you're going to enjoy it. Before I talk more about my guest, let me tell you a little bit about the Spiritual But Not Religious show and the Spiritual Broadcasting Network. We've uh, recently moved into a new studio. Uh, we're here in Sarasota, Florida. If you're familiar with Sarasota, we're on the corner of Osprey and uh, Siesta Drive. Siesta goes right out to the beaches. We've got, uh, you know, the Sarasota community is a really spiritual community. It's really kind of a, the hidden uh, spiritual mecca of Florida. So if you get a chance to get down this way, be sure and do that. Uh, our, our whole purpose uh, is to open more minds to a, a, a wider consciousness, to a broader consciousness, to, so that we can begin to experience a transformation. The guests that we bring on are, are authors who are on the authors and, and artists and uh, people who are on the cutting edge of consciousness change, transformation. Uh, our world has been dominated by the dark side for uh, thousands of years, and, and it's, it's time now for the light side to become the predominant uh, factor in our lives. We're never going to do away with the dark side. We're not supposed to. We need, we need both the dark and light in order for, uh, to survive in this uh, world of polarity. The light needs the dark to support it and vice versa. But the, we don't have to be experiencing life with the, uh, the dark side being so dominant. We're seeing it really powerfully in, in uh, finances, in the Arab Spring, in, in all that's going on now. This is a pretty amazing time to be alive. So we're here every every uh, Tuesday night, 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Be sure and come back. We've got some great guests lined up for next week. My guest tonight is uh, is uh, Diana Durham. She's written a book called The Return of King Arthur. Now, uh, also she's written a play. So she's a playwright and an author and a very bright lady, uh, Percival and the Grail. We're going to talk quite a bit tonight about the Grail and... Uh, what that uh, Grail story actually means to you. We'll be talking about some of the characters and uh, how maybe you can take some of this information, bring it into your life, and make it work to your benefit and the benefit of your loved ones and those people who are around you. So, Tom, have we got uh, Diana? Are we ready to bring her on? Sure, Hello, Diana. Hi. Hi there. Uh, you're able to hear me now? Yes. Oh, good. Well, so we got to, we have a good connection. I think we're we're in for uh, a good uh, a good evening of, of talk here. Everything seems to be working well on the technical end, so I think we'll have a great time. Uh, listen, before we get into uh, your work, and listen, the, the the book you've written is a marvelous book. You're you're a really good author. You've written it's well written and uh, concise, Thank you. Uh, and, it, and it's just jam packed with some. Really uh, great information. Uh, but before we get there, how about a little background on you? Where where'd you come from? You were you were in it was in England uh, that you were born in. Yes, yes, I was, I was born and raised in England and educated there, uh -huh. and uh, lived there until my late thirties, and then my family and I uh, moved to the states. What well, what caused you to move from to the states? Oh, at that time it was really my husband's career. Uh huh brought us over here. What, um, what does he do? He's in television. Oh, okay, great. He's a filmmaker. Aha, uh -huh. very good. And, and um, we, he, in, and of course, um, he'd always in some ways wanted to come and work here in the States. There's more scope here, at least in filmmaking, you know, movie making. Right. So, and w where are you living now? Um, we live on the East Coast in uh, New Hampshire. Aha. Uh -huh. So you got a pretty mild winter up there, or is it... Kind of so far, it's been remarkable. Yeah. Um, no snow at all during, well, or barely any snow during January, and still really nothing, and, and much higher temperatures than normal. We have, our, our weather here is, uh, is, is, it's been 78 years since we've seen anything like uh, what we're, we're seeing in the way of mildness. It's been a wonderful winter. I'm a little afraid of what summer might bring, but ah. it's been a wonderful winter. 
I think Europe seems to be getting our our winter at the moment, actually. Uh, yeah, I think you're right. Mm. So, so did you did you go to school to become a writer? I, I mean, you have a, a collegiate um, background. I studied. Well, I I did study literature in um, at university. Uh -huh. I, I studied English literature. Uh -huh. I did my degree in in that, and um, really at that time, and particularly in the English literature tradition, you didn't. If you wanted to become a writer, you just wrote. <laughs> right. You know, you read the great writers and you wrote. You, you had to sort of figure it out. There weren't the same quantity of, or even the idea of creative writing programs around at that time. Uh huh. So, so that's uh, how you got your start. You just kind of picked up the pen and or the typewriter or the computer. You're, and went you're, at it. you're, you're inspired. You're inspired by. Yeah, I was inspired by the writers and the poets. I, 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 I loved the way they used language to create the kind of magic, it's almost like a magic substance. Um, yeah, absolutely, I understand that. And, yeah. yeah. So what, what kind of a, a spiritual or religious uh, environment did you grow up in? Um, none at all, really. Um, my family, we weren't religious. Um, in England, there isn't the um, a supposed, anyway, separation of church and state. So the schools are more or less Church of England. You know, you sing hymns and you act out the nativity play at Christmas and things like that, you know, in, in the junior school. But, um, no, I wasn't religious like. at all. And I, in fact, I, I loathed everything to do with um, spirituality uh -huh. and religion because it often had been, I, I guess it had, come to be associated, in just in my experience anyway, with inauthenticity. Right. Hypocrisy? Hi, hypocrisy well, not even hypocrisy. I mean, th yeah, so that, that, that does exist, but more with a sense of um, people not really being themselves. Right. And yet, or, or trying to be good, or trying to be something, trying to be nice. Rather than it being genuine and coming from an inner... Yes, so, uh -huh. yes. And then, really, to cut a long story short, uh, when I was about 18, I, I I kind of met up with a part of my family who, they weren't like a blood tie, but we were connected um, through the first marriage of my aunt. Uh -huh. And this was a, a branch of my family that lived in Canada. I'd never heard about them. And uh, my cousin... It, uh, who was a young woman at that time, came and stayed with me. Um, and sh she, they, she, and that part of them, some of that part of my family, were involved in spiritual community. And there was something about this cousin of mine that was really compelling. She really was, or, you know, she had this quality about her that really touched me. And when I finished my high school, um, I wanted to go traveling, and I, I ended up going to Canada to visit this branch of my family, which took me to a community of people way up in the Caribou region of British Columbia. Oh, wow. Very, very new and exciting um, landscape and way of life for me from coming from suburban England, as I had done. And um, I was very resistant. I... I, I to the spiritual idea, I didn't want to be, I thought I might be brainwashed or something. <laughs> um, a cult, but, huh? Uh, you know, I, but these people, more, I just really fell in love with them. They, and they really did have this quality about them of authenticity. And they spoke about being in the moment. It's not, it's not what you do, it's who you are. You know, right. it's very simple. But the whole thing was about emphasizing the being quality. The, right. the power of being, the power of presence, if you, right. if you see what I mean. Rather than, rather than the, uh, uh, I, I have to live to some kind of doctrine. Right, exactly. Right. A belief system, yes. So was that kind of a metaphysical or uh, that kind of a spiritual thing, or did it have some uh, a major religious religion beneath uh, their belief system? No, it was, it was a very much... Um, wanting to put into practice um, a very much an embodied spirituality. Uh -huh. And while I was there, I stayed there for about six weeks on this 
community and I worked in the kitchens and in the gardens and got to know all these people and they were terribly kind to me. And they also had no investment in me. You know, was, they weren't trying to make me be anything or do anything. They if I wanted to, to join in, that was fine. If I didn't, that was fine. Right. Too. Uh, but then when I was during that time, um, I, I had a kind of an experience of, I guess we'd call it transfiguration, really. Uh-huh. I was just having tea one evening, quietly, <laughs> with some friends in their little home as part of this community, and nothing very extraordinary was going on. But I suddenly had one of these experiences that you hear about or read about, whereby a kind of power rose up in me. And, um, you know, at the time and since, I've always thought of it as rather like a golden sun rising. Right. And I felt full of this incredible power. And it, this power and this energy was what people, you know, those words that we have, like love, truth, this is what that was talking about. Do you know what I mean? I suddenly yes. knew what those words really meant. And I suddenly thought, oh, my goodness, this is true of everyone. But we very rarely experience it. So did you, did you notice a, 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 a complete reordering of your, of your beliefs at that point, your, of your thinking? I mean, was there a restructuring went on there? In, in yes, I think, you, I, I think you could say that there was. Right. I, I, because, in, in the sense that I suddenly realized that there was a dimension available to us as human beings that was absolutely real. You right. couldn't deny this. And, but I also, and, and the implications were enormous because once you had some kind of inkling of this um, dimension of yourself, it would change everything about the way you acted. Everything changes. Everything, under, yes. And it, you wouldn't be rule-based anymore, right? Right. You, you wouldn't, because this quality of oneself was inherently generative and beneficent and loving, it was powerful, and it, it, so it wasn't victim either. And so that had a huge in, implications. And as I say, the other huge impl- set of implications was that most of the time we don't touch intimate this very much. No, we you know? don't. Or we, or we do do so theoretically. Right. And so that's sort of interesting, you know. That here's this thing available to us, but we don't know it very much. Were you were you uh, writing at this time also, or was no, not really. I mean, only as a, as a teenager, I wrote, I did write poems and right. um, bits and pieces of prose, but I hadn't started seriously writing. And that that came uh, several years later, many years. Yes, later. it did because really, what happened was I beginning. You could say beginning with that process of going to the community and the, the experience of touching into this energy. Um, then later on, I started a thought process that just went on backwards and forwards um, intermittently about the Grail myth and the Arthurian myth. So you think you were you were led by some invisible part of your being, some force that, that brought you to this, or how? What was your experience with that? Uh, I think I co- I think I found it out. I think um, I think from a very early age, without really um, knowing it very consciously at the time I was searching I was really really deeply inquiring about life about what we were doing here about why most of the people I met were very unhappy uh-huh. <laughs> you know about and, and as a much younger child um, you know all those simple questions that we, we need to ask every generation you know why are there wars and um, why I, I remember seeing when I was about 10 or 11, um, TV documentary footage of um, when the Allied troops opened up some of the death camps in, um, you know, following the second, the end of the Second World War. Dachau and... Dachau, and seeing those images, and you, yeah. you, the thought that goes through your mind is, how could this happen? What, what is it about us as human beings that would make us do that? Yeah, how is this possible How all? is this possible? Right. What's really going on here? Yeah. So I think there was this deep process of inquiry that in the end led me to this community and to this experience. 
And, and, and was that, if, if your experience was like mine at all, I, the answers to those questions that I got were, were not very good answers. They just didn't really satisfy uh, it, it, when I talked with the people in my No, no, no one seemed to be going to the core of it. No, they had no clue. Uh, no, no, no clue, no. And, and so that's what, that's what led you on kind of a spiritual odyssey? Or was that I how think you so, yes. Yes, right. Yeah, I think I think that you know, like all of us has that kind. Although the process may be different, we all have to enter that at some point, don't we? That yes, I think so. We, we we go on that spiritual quest only to find that everything was right where we were standing. Yes, exactly. <laughs> yeah, pretty amazing. How did you yes. get how did you get tuned into the Grail story? What was you know what was it? That yeah, well, I I don't I don't I don't remember really how it began. I remember the first thought I had was I was living communally. This was later on. Uh-huh. I was older and... Stateside communal... at that point or... I'm sorry? Were you stateside? I was back in England. Okay. And I I started to... Ha I, living communally and in this very deep space that we had together, We were, it, there was quite a deep connection. And it sort of to to the part, to the kind of human condition part of oneself it was um it could be quite challenging to live like that absolutely and i began to think about my experience how sometimes it felt really marvelous and other times it felt uncomfortable and i started suddenly the thought came into my mind of the stories of the quest for the grail uh -huh. and the way that those knights would travel through rather nightmarish landscapes you know uh, deep dark forests and barren moorlands, and they'd meet monsters and overcome things. And but then every now and again, some one of them would step into the pr place of innocence and the Grail Castle. And I suddenly thought, oh, I see what that's about. It's about this internal experience where sometimes you're in your fear, and and then every now and again you step out of it, and you 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 step into your your innocence. And actually, and actually feel a safety there. Yes. That you don't feel otherwise. That's right. And a largeness too, isn't it? There's a kind of a, a, a vastness that goes with that feeling. Absolutely, absolutely. So it's like what you just said—that you, you know, that the, the it, it's all inside you, but you don't always connect to it. Most of the time, we don't connect to it. A lot of the time, we don't connect yeah. to it. Yeah, but you know, more and more, I find myself. Uh, living out of that space. Yes. I, I really use that part of my being as a compass more now than I ever did before. Yes. And far less from my head. Yes. And I, I think that that's our learning in this era. And that, by the way, is what the Grail myth is, is all about. Uh -huh. So I began this thought process at that moment in time. I suddenly thought, oh, that's what the Grail quest is. And then I just carried on this thought process over a few years, thinking backwards and forwards between my experience and, the, and this myth. And I gradually built an awareness of what the myth was about. Uh -huh. what, and, then, you, and then I wrote, so, so that led eventually to writing the book. At, at that point, were you, were you uh, at all uh, reading uh, uh, Campbell and, and his... I didn't read Joseph Campbell. I mean, I knew a little, little snippets, really. Uh -huh. I didn't... I read him in greater depth when I came to write the book because I, I knew I wanted to um, draw a little bit on, on some of his thinking in right. it. So but I, you, I wasn't a student of his. Did you, did, did, did you find him to be pretty right on in your experience? In the, you know, the yes, I think, I think very, very beautifully. Very yeah. beautiful. I, I, I did watch the series, that marvelous series that Bill, the interview with Bill Moyers. Bill Moyers, that was a wonderful series. Wasn't yes, it? that was a beautiful series. That was a, that was one of those life changing kinds of, of of series, at least for me. I think for you know. Thousands. I think for many people. Yeah. I, yes, I agree. So, how about giving us uh, tell the story of the Grail uh, in kind of a condensed form, so our viewers will you know really be uh, kind of tuned in more to what we're going to be talking about here. Yes, well, I, I'd love to. I um. The Grail story is a little more obscure to us. Most people know a little bit about King Arthur, you know, drawing the sword out of the stone, the right. round table, the love affair, the Lancelot, and so on. 
but we, we don't know as much about the Grail story. Right. Um, there are possibly one of the reasons for that is that there are a lot of different versions of it, and so it can all seem a bit um, incoherent. But the version that I tend to draw on the most is a 12th century, comes from the 12th century. It's the version by a French poet called Chrétien de Troy. But I, in my retelling, when I wrote my play, I did, I did change it a little bit. Of course, everyone who tells these stories does that. They, yes. they, they work them around a little bit to draw out the meaning that they've gained from them. But essentially, I've come to see the Grail story as a, as a, a wonderful, wonderful developmental process, where, which, which is like before and after the moment of epiphany. You know, before and after the moment that, you know, my, my experience, let, let's say, of that transfiguration or, you know, whenever you first touch into that. Right. So Percival is this young man who has been brought up in Wales, and Wales at that time, when the, this was ri- being written, denoted a really remote, um, wild place, which was cut off from the mainstream. And so this young man really doesn't know anything about anything. One day he's out in the woods and he sees five knights um, come riding by. They sort of appear out of the woods and he is dazzled by them. He's never seen anything so beautiful. And he, but he doesn't know what they are. He doesn't even know that they're knights. And he asks them what they are. And they're, they're a bit taken aback because they can't believe how naive he is. But they say, well, we're knights. And he said, well, how did you become a knight? And they said, well, King Arthur made us knights and he said tell me where he is I I just want to go and find him and become a knight and so he does basically he he runs off home he tells his mother she faints in horror because of course the reason she's been bringing him up in obscurity is to protect him from becoming a knight (laughs) (laughs) Uh, because his brothers were killed as knights and Uh so on anyway he doesn't listen to her he sets off he finds King Arthur but just before he comes to the court he Mm -hmm. He comes upon a very fierce um, knight called the Red Knight because he's got bright red armor on. Right. And Percival looks at this red armor and thinks, I really like that. I'm going to take that. And he says to the knight, I'm going to take that off you. And the Red Knight is so taken aback where he just thinks he's so silly that he humors him. He doesn't do him any harm. And Percival carries on. And now he doesn't know it, but this Red Knight's actually been terrorizing Arthur's court. So... Uh Uh, he had a close shave there without knowing it. Oops. And um, anyway, so he rushes into the court. He asks to be knighted. He is knighted, and he sets off again. He finds a red knight, and he does kill him. He throws a javelin in the weak point of his armor. And he takes his red armor, and he sets off. And as far as he's concerned, that's it. He's going to go home and uh, find his mum again and show her this lovely red armor. As far as he's concerned, it's, he's done what he set out to do, he's become a knight, and that's it. End of story. End of story. But uh, it's not quite what happens. The next thing that happens is he comes, he's taken in by a very um, benign, gentlemanly knight called Sigourneman, who realizes that he doesn't know, that Percival doesn't know very much about knighthood, and takes him under his wing, trains him, um, t- shows him the skills of knighthood, um, and he also gives him advice. And one piece of advice is not to talk too much because he realizes that every time Percival opens his mouth, he sounds rather foolish because he's so naive about the ways of the world. And so he says, don't talk too much. Don't ask too many questions. And Percival thanks him, and he sets off again. And he also comes upon us his a, a very lovely maiden <clears throat> who's being besieged her castle is being besieged by some wicked knights, and he manages to overcome these knights and free her. And he sends the two wicked knights back to King Arthur's court to sort of report in his name. But he won't stay with his sweetheart, she's called Blanche Fleur, because he feels he must go home and find his mother. So he sets off again. Next thing is, he comes to a river and he can see no place to cross. And um, a man in a boat comes sailing well, sort of floating down the river, and he's fishing. And the man says, no, there's no place to cross, but you can stay in my castle tonight if you like. And so 
Percival thanks him and looks around. He can't see it. And then it suddenly appears a little bit like by magic. <laughs> Goes into the castle. He, the same man who was in the boat is there on a couch. He greets Percival and apologizes. He can't get up. And the implication is that he's wounded. And this figure is actually the wounded Fisher King. Ah, okay. So Percival sits beside him, and then they see the Grail being taken through the hall. They're in this beautiful banqueting hall. And the Grail comes out of one room, and it passes through the banqueting hall, and it goes into um, another adjoining room. And Percival really wants to find out about who this Grail is for. Whom does a Grail serve, he's wondering. But then he remembers Gorneman's advice not to talk too much, and so he doesn't ask. And really then that's the end. He thinks, oh, he thinks, well, I'll ask in the morning, I'll ask one of the serving lads, and then I'll find out, but I won't seem rude. Anyway, in the morning, of course, there's no one there. The castle's deserted. Um, Percival sets off thinking he might find them in the forest. Maybe they went hunting, but, of course, he doesn't find them. Instead, he finds a maiden sitting under a tree weeping for her uh, dead lover. And she, he he tries to um, comfort her, and then she starts cross-questioning him. She asks him, where did you stay last night? And he tells her, and then she said, did you see the grail? And he said, yes. And then she said, did you ask about it? And he says, no. And then she starts laying into him, and she says, well, you should have done, because he you stayed with the wounded king, and if you'd asked about the grail, you'd have you'd have healed him huh? you'd have healed the king uh -huh. and if you would healed the king you would have he restored the wasteland because the wounded king rules over a wasteland kingdom the crops fail the cattle cannot reproduce and the land is ravaged by war now percival's confused because he doesn't he doesn't know all this and he doesn't really understand why he's responsible and he doesn't really hear what she's saying but then she tells him something else which is that his mother's died and that really does get through to him. And then he feels disoriented and sad because he, he doesn't really know what to do because he was trying to get home. So he, he kind of wanders off dejectedly. But meanwhile, back at King Arthur's court, these knights and various other people have been showing up in Percival's name. And King Arthur's really impressed by what Percival's been doing, and he wants to come and find him and bring him back to court and give him, a, you know, do honor, do him honor. Right. And so that's what happens. He finds him, he brings him back to court, he holds a great banquet in his honor and at the height of the festivities they're all praising Percival for what he's done for all his good deeds of overcoming these knights. But then right at the height of their festivities this terrible hag enters the hall and she points a finger at Percival and says you didn't do the most important thing you didn't ask you know, you saw the grail and you had the opportunity, but you didn't ask. Because you didn't ask who is served from it, um, the wounded king wasn't healed. And because he isn't, wasn't healed, the wasteland won't be restored. And finally, Percival says, aha, I'm, I'm on this quest. He, and he stands up and he says, right, well, I won't rest until I find that castle again. And I ask and I find out who's served from the grail. And he sets off again. And five years go past, and he hasn't found the castle, and he's become quite dejected. He's overcome a load more wicked knights, but he feels futile. Then he, by, he comes upon some um, ladies uh, accompanied by knights who've been doing penance. It's Good Friday, but he's lost all track of time. And they tell him that they've just come from a holy man, a hermit, who gave them absolution for their sins. And... Um, he says, I'd like to find this hermit, and he does. He goes into the hermit's cell and kneels and tells him all his woes and how he was in the Grail Castle and he didn't ask. And, and then the hermit says to him, ah, well, you've got to, it, it's all about your name, Percival. Um, pierce the Veil. His name can, uh -huh. can mean Pierce the Veil. Right. And then he tells him that there was another, when he was in that castle with the wounded king, the, where the, there was a room that the grail was taken into and there had been an, another person living in that room all the time but he didn't know it and this, that, this other character who we don't see in the story I call him the grail king um, is very refined he's an elderly man with fine white hair and he's 
nature so fine that all he needs to live on is the white wafers served to him from the grail. So he's a godlike figure, right. and he lives in this inner room. And it's he who is served from the grail. So Percival doesn't go back to the castle, but he does find the answer to the question. And what, what this is a metaphor, it, that, that moment when he's in the grail castle and the, and the grail moves past is a metaphor. The grail is a symbol of our own heart when we, are, when we experience that epiphany and that fullness that I had when I had that experience of transfiguration, for uh -huh. instance. Suddenly, when we find the grail, it's a metaphor for the experience of transfiguration, for the experience of connecting to that deeper order of our own being. And, and that's what piercing the veil means. And, and in, in that process, what, uh, you know, what are the questions that Percival didn't ask? Do, do we ever find that? Well, you, the, that, the whole thing about the question is that what you were talking about is that y we might touch into these experiences, but we don't understand them yet. Right. We, and so asking the question or coming to understand its answer is another, is symbolizing this, the process of the development in ourselves of becoming consciously aware of how we work of what our makeup is. So it's kind of like an awakening. Is what, yes. Yes. There's the, well, you, t you have the epiphany. You just, you right. suddenly, there you are. You've landed in the Grail Castle. Or you've, you've had this epiphany of, like in my experience in that community when I was a young woman, I suddenly touched into this power, right? Right. But it didn't last, and I didn't fully understand what it meant or how to recreate it or how to live from it. Right. And so we start to question this part of us, and as we question, we begin to learn more. Yes, About yes. how to live in that space. And Absolutely. We become conscious of it so that now you said, you know, now it's much more a, a guide by the way I live my life. Yes. You see, that's you've become consciously aware of how to work with this aspect of yourself, really. Yeah, and I find that, that part of us is really very kind. Yes. And a very kind, very empath empathic, and uh, it, it, it's just a really kind of a diametric opposite of the uh, pride and ego we find on the other side. That you know that. Uh, yes. Well, so then they start to come into relationship, right? Okay. That's they have to. At some point, you have to be able to put your arm around that part of you and and own it. Yes. So. In, in how, how do you see, you know, knowing the story, hearing the story, uh, tells us that, okay, this is, this is available to us. Is there, do you find there's a, there's a, a method, a, a way that people can use this grail story to find their own? Well, um, I, I don't know, I suppose, is the short answer. I, I think part of the work that I want to do and have been doing is to develop it as a tool for right. people to understand that. I do think that's why it's persisted in, in our culture for so long. What do, you think, what do you think has to happen to bring us to that place? Is, 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 you know, oftentimes you know, it's been said that pain is the touchstone to spirituality. Is it pain that brings us there, or can it be you know, joy, I suspect, even? Yeah, well, I, I, it's a good question. I mean, Probably both. Um, right. Um, what's interesting about Percival's story is that he is not in pain when he sets off. He's all, he's 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 unconsciously in that place of um, the flow, right? Right. You know, he can do no wrong. Right. He he finds King Arthur. He becomes a knight. He overcomes the Red Knight. He learns all the skills of knighthood. He he defends Blanche Fleur. He overcomes the other knights. He's just on a roll, right? Exactly, and not he's too on much, a roll. not much blocking his progress. Nothing, right? Because he's not questioning himself. He's not conditioned. He hasn't taken on the advice of people, right? Uh huh. Because actually, I've shortened. Obviously, I've simplified the story, but there's lots of people are giving him advice. His mother, Sir Gornament, various people, and some of it he listens to. Some of it he doesn't, right? When you know, when do we? When should we take on advice? When, when shouldn't we? When do we? You, but, so, so you, 
so he can he can do no wrong. Then he has this experience of epiphany, where and that's that moment when we suddenly realize that everything isn't outside of ourselves. Right. Goals, points of inspiration, um, things to overcome, skills to learn, <coughs> advice. All of those things, it's like our world is all out there and we're headed toward it, right? Right. But then we have this, we have this amazing experience where suddenly we realize, wow, you know what? The power's inside me. I create my world. Yeah, and everything changes at that and point. Everything changes. And so you can't go on the same. And that's why after that, everything goes wrong for him. You I, know, know? I, I think the, the biggest thing that happened for me in that, in that process was when I began to realize that I created my own world, I, I started, you know, and, and, and I know that, you know, like everything comes back to us. You know, yes. what goes, and so I started really working at putting out nothing but good stuff. Because yes. I, I figured sooner or later that's all that's going to come back in my direction. Exactly. And, and interestingly enough, uh, I, I have good things that happen that I can't put my finger on and say, well, this is why that happened. But, and I know that it's just because of that, that change, you know, mm -hmm. they, these things, they just almost magically start to happen for you. You're cared for when there's no reason to be cared for. <laughs> but the, and the other interesting thing, and this is where the wounded Fisher King is a very, very, very interesting and important part of this whole story. Uh-huh. It's because it's this understanding in us that gives us leverage over what we call evil in the world. In other words, it gives us some power, is what I'm hearing. Yes, so. it, yes, it gives us a way to understand it and to shift it. Um, and uh, I want to talk about the Wounded King uh, because that's the other thing that the story is it gives us a way to understand um, what what goes on in you know in in in, in the various um, tyrants that they've been. I mean, we can look at Hitler, and we can look at Stalin. We can we can look at more recent people. Um, we can look at the nuttiness that there's been recently on Wall Street. You know, oh. the crash and the excesses and once we start to understand that there's this whole, di whole, whole dimension, if you like, of self, we also understand what happens when, when people are only operating out of a part of that self. Because that's what the Wounded King symbolizes. Right. And, and, and actually more on the, uh, some call it the dark side or the shadow side than the wholeness? Yes, exactly. And that the inflation, the inflated identity, um, is is a cover up. It that that you see the wound, that the wound is actually the sense of disconnect from and, that inner power. And a causal uh, kind of uh, basic insecurity because of that disconnect. Exactly, and an emptiness that can never be filled. Right, there's just not enough that you can't put enough of anything in there. More, right. and more and more and more. You, see, you need more and more and more. Yeah. yeah. Well, we've certainly seen that played out in Wall Street in uh, absolutely. real time, big time. Absolutely. And it's not, and not, it's not a, close to so home. You see, the, 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 it used to be that the king and the land, the king and the land are one, right? That you, so this is also, this whole myth is also about the way that once identity is whole, it, it means that your actions are going to be of that same nature. Yes. Of you're going to think and act from a whole, a kind of a, a sense of the whole rather than a narrow agenda. Right. So, so do you think that, uh, that the world now is kind of going through its own quest for the grail? Not just, not just, the, uh, not just for a few people, you know, an individual, but the world. I mean, when you look at all the things that are happening, it, it appears that 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 process, the story you just told, is happening on a much larger scale. It, yes, I think it is. I think it is. I do think that. Yeah. Well, you know, part of what, what not part of, our big focus here is to, is to you know, to help uh, bring as many people into this awakened state that you're talking about that we can in the belief that at some point we reach a tipping point and, and instead of 
you know, the dark side being the dominant force, it will always be with us, that we flip into where the light side is the dominant yes. force. I, I think many people are, are thinking and feeling this in one way or languaging it in one way or another. Yeah. And I certainly think that the, it's there in the pattern of the myth uh, as well, you know. It's well, there, it, it does like a code. It's like a code, and, and is it, all, it kind of really offers uh, hope that the, the, of the possibility of that being real. Yeah, well, it is real. Well, yeah, but there's so much cynicism in the world, and we're brought right. up within the frame of that cynicism to yes. be able to escape that. Uh, it's a very powerful thing. I, uh, you know, I, I, I don't think uh, that it takes a huge amount of, uh, in other words, I don't think we have to have 60% or 50% of, of the population in order for that all to happen. I think it can happen with far less numbers than, than that may be. Yes. How do you think the, the, the Grail story plays with, uh, you know, with what we, what we hear today about 2012 and, uh, and all the goings on there? you think there's a connection? Well, um, not really. No, I mean, I had, it's not something that I've, uh, that I've thought, you know, I don't. I, I think that that whole, that might just be another one of those languages, if you know what I mean, uh -huh. that is looking and toward and sensing um, a shift. Um, because my own, having looked into the Mayan thing a little bit, um, I think, as far as I can understand and remember, it was more a, a system of um, cycles, you know, that, that was yes. a way of, of, of understanding the cycling of time. Yes. Cre greater cycles coming round. The and cal their calendar system. Yeah, yes. yeah. Um, you see, I think the world gets created out of our own... Um, future, if you know what I mean. We, 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 cr we create the future as we live here. Ab absolutely. And a and because the point is that we aren't only of this dimension, right? So the, 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 the Grail story very clearly is telling us, and not just the Grail story, but many other um, sacred writings and forms of symbolism tell us about um, the fact that yeah, there, there is the visible and the invisible side of everything and of us. And you, you, you know, so we die, but our being doesn't die. It's just that we leave this body behind. Yes, our consciousness is not going to be destroyed. No, and we've accumulated something. And so then when we come back again, we're going to be rolling on that new cycle, if you know what I mean. Well, I do, and, and, and which brings me to a question I had thought about when I, while I was reading your work here. I, I, I gee, I just, look, by the way, it, 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 you, you would be well served to go uh, pick this book up. Uh, what's your website, uh, Diana? You want to tell them your website? Um, yes, it's dianadurham.net. And and you know it's 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 a good read, and, and you you will like it a lot. But what what came to me was. Do you think you led a past life during this period? Do you think you were somehow or other, con I mean, have you had any kind of connection with that? No, I haven't had that feeling. I just, I do know that, um, I know that there's something about the land mass of England, of uh -huh. Britain, that is incredibly deep in me. So I think I've probably, you know, it, it always feels like you've, I've, you've participated in these sort of layers, you know. Yes. Well, you know, England uh, or the Great Britain, whatever term you want to use, we we have a lot of friends there. We've had uh, guests from from there, and uh, just uh, uh, an amazing. Uh, I mean, it's a very spiritual land. It is actually. It yeah. is. It is. A, it is. Yes. And I don't think that, you know, in these modern times, it gets the credence that it deserves for that. No, I don't think that's seen as much. Right, right. Mm. Uh, well, you know, I guess it's probably, but, but you know, at the same time, what's interesting when you think about it is that the Beatles also came from there, from Liverpool, right? Right, that incredible creativity. Well, not only that, what, what they also ended up bringing us was Eastern philosophy through the Maharishi Mahat Yoga yes. and, and, and transcendental meditation. If yes. it hadn't been for the Beatles, we, 
you know, we wouldn't be where East meets West, where we are today. Which, you, you think know. they were that? You you think they were that? Um, oh, they were def definitely that influential uh, in, in that whole process. Mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, I forget which one. One of one of them said that uh, uh, that uh, had they met him earlier, they'd have saved a lot of drug money. Yes. Because <laughs> <laughs> it took them to places that they were looking to you know to go to. Yes. Yeah. Which is pretty cool. So let's talk a bit about uh, about King Arthur and uh, about what I'd really like to talk about is Excalibur. Oh, right. Okay. All right. And, and, uh, and, and what is the metaphor for Excalibur? What's, what's, what's it telling us? You know, one of the things that I, you know, like that, that I find very interesting is that when, when, it, when it's finally thrown into the lake, that it is a feminine hand. Yeah. That reaches up and takes that. And yes, takes it it's a water. very beautiful symbol. Yeah, it's a, yeah, tell us a bit about that. Well, um, okay. Well, Excalibur. First of all, of course, it's it's this marvelous symbol because it's stuck in stone. Right. Actually, in some versions, it's an anvil on a stone. Right. The sword is in the anvil on the stone, and um, Arthur pulls it out at the beginning of the story. And the reason he's, a, he's able to do that is because he's, he doesn't want anything for himself. He's actually pulling it out to try to give his half-brother a sword right. in the tournament. So he's not trying to be king. Everyone else wants to be king. That The other knight's trying to desperately to pull this thing out. And all, what that symbolism is telling us is lots and lots of things. It's, it's telling us that the true leader is the one who, he, because he or she is already aligned with their, with their flow of presence, right? Yes. Then the structure comes to them. So they're polarized, right? They're not trying to get something right. from the external world. The, the external world will come to them. So as soon as he, he he was able to draw the sword out, and the kingdom was his immediately. Well, you know what's interesting about that is that you would think that once that happened, that you know the world would be your oyster and everything would come your way, and you're king now. And that's hardly what happened with Arthur. Well, it it was in the sense that he was immediately king. Yes. Yes. But then he he had a bit of work to do. He had a lot of work to do. <laughs> <laughs> a bit yeah. of work, yes, that's, uh, absolutely. <laughs> he did, I, especially in the area of relationships. Well, yeah. I guess I don't know. There's so many ways of of understanding all of that. I tried to do some. I I did go into that in my book as right. best I could. Right. Um. What do you think? What do you think? Uh, Arthur, as a figure, as a character, is really trying to say to us. Well, King Arthur symbolizes the great leader. Right. He he symbolizes the, the mentor. And is that is that symbolism symbolism on the you know the bigger scale and also on the personal, where you have the mentor within. Yes, you can. All of these things can be thought of in, on all those different levels. Right. But he he so he he shows the qualities that a great leader has. I.e., he creates the round table, right? Yes. He, he that he, was a gift, right? Yes, it was his. It was the dowry gift with from Guinevere. Right. right. And so there's the part, the primary partnership with Guinevere, and then. Here comes a circle. It, it, it gets expanded, and then it it becomes the symbol of the united kingdom. Right. So he is the person who's able to bring things together, and he wants to grow leadership in other people. He does not take the lead. He, he it's a round table. Yes. There is no hierarchy. He is king, but he's not saying I'm the I'm the chief. You've got to kind of work. In a way, you've got to kind of worship me. Well, it was kind of an early democracy, wasn't it? Yes, 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 yes it was, and it was saying, y "You've, you've got as you've got equal access to the center of that table, meaning, you've got as your contribution is as valuable as mine. We're peers here. We're peers of the realm, and." 
so so the, the round table is a symbol of the, of, a, of the possibility of a, co- a new form of leadership, a collective form of leadership. Which the world sorely needs at this point. Really needs, really needs. And yeah. some people are beginning to explore the dynamics of this in lots of different ways. Uh-huh. So that it's not just you pool intelligence, you know, well, I've got this idea and I've got this idea, but you actually create a kind of a group field, a collective field of wisdom where you draw down a kind of collective energy. So how does, how does uh, Merlin and his magic play into that? I mean, what, what, well, I mean, I mean, because, you know, there are things that we don't understand and, and do seem magical that just create some big changes that happen for us. How does, yes. how, how does Merlin play into this whole, uh, even with the Grail, is, is, was Merlin connected with uh, Percival at all in the Grail? Um, no, Merlin, Merlin is in the background of some of the Grail stories. He doesn't come into Cretin de Troy's version. Right. Um, I, I put him in in my play, but he, he doesn't come into it. You see, Merlin, Merlin has the overview. Uh-huh. He, he, understands, he understands that there's the inner and the outer, right? He knows the importance of that. Right. He knows when, he's, when he takes his steps to help become, have, have Arthur be born and then become king yes. and then unite the kingdom, he, what, what was his end game? The end game was, was, was even beyond that. The end game was to find the grail. Why? Because the end game ain't setting up a great organization. The end game is having individuals really know who they are. Absolutely. Because then you've got traction. Then you can do anything. You can work with people. You can create the round table then. So that was, to, to me, Merlin is, the, is Merlin and um, Morgana in the stories are the ones who already know about the importance of the two worlds being one, the inner and the outer. And they're just working at making all that come together. Yes, absolutely. I got gotcha. you. Yes. Well, that, uh, uh, you know, that story has had, you know, somehow or other, it not only, you know, it's a nice story, but I think, you know, when you get into it, it also starts to do things to you on an inner level outside of your thinking processes. Yes. Uh, the changes begin to occur to you, uh, for you, in you, because of the exposure to the story itself. I, is, I think that's really interesting. I, I, I believe that that is some kind of ritual. Aha. Uh-huh. You know, where you change or rearrange or come to understand your own inner landscape by, by, un, by kind of in, interacting with something outside of yourself, which could be a story. Absolutely. I think yeah. probably more oh, often... Oh, and, you know, sometimes it's actually a place. It's a physical, sacred space or something like that. But Right. And so, but I, you know, and so often, I think you're right on, the story is, is huge in tra- transformations. That's really... Isn't that really how all this kind of got passed down to us? Yes. You know, the oral tradition was, yes. the, was the story. Storytelling. And without the story, we, you know, we wouldn't have a clue of who we are. Yes. Or, or what we are. Yes. Well, you're you're a great storyteller. Your your your, your book is excellent, I, and also your your play is. Thank you. Yeah, you're a very creative lady. What's your next project? What are you doing now? Well, are you um, just kind of sitting back, taking it easy, or are you? <laughs> no, actually, well, I have just I have finished drafting a second nonfiction book. Uh huh. And I don't quite know what I'm going. I, I mean, it hasn't yet been published. Um, <clears throat> And I'm not sure yet exactly what I'm going to call it, but <clears throat> one t- thought, one of the titles I've come up with is the New Moral Center, decoding the wisdom teachings. Oh, that's the that's subtitle, but the main title, the New Moral Center. And I'm wanting to to sort of sh- show that in all of these many many traditions of wisdom teachings, this is what that that there's kind of a pattern encoded in them, which is that we are this larger. We have this expanded identity that we don't always touch into. Yes. But it's not uh, some sort of 
that spirituality isn't some nice kind of optional hobby. <laughs> no. You know, which sometimes I've, people talk about it as if it's an optional hobby. Well, yeah. It, you know it, what I mean? Like, I could, like, like playing golf occasionally. Like playing golf, and, and, and it's really been picked up as far as, how, you know, how can I get this and get that, and, you know. Right, or, or yes, or that. Whereas the, it, it's actually, uh, this is, it's, it's where we're, a, it's what we're aiming for, because it's going to let us become intelligent, right? Yes. Be- become intelligent, compassionate human beings, because it's who we really are. We, we, we really are. That yes. it, it's it's that false belief that we're uh, that we're not, you know, yes. that, that fear and that lack kind of thing. When, Absolutely. Yeah, the, the driving force is uh, is fear, and uh, yes. And, and, but but and we just haven't come to understand the real power of love. No. And and once we once we find that, you know, I, where, where I've come down to with all this is is when you start. In this path, you get into this center space, you start to vibrate differently. Yes. And so you're on a different channel. Yes. And you're not affected by the channel over here, just like with TV. You, you, they don't cross. Exactly. And so a lot of trouble you would find in this channel, you're not having it over here. Yes, exactly. Every, everything, everything has changed. Yes, Listen, absolutely. we're down to, a, down to a couple of minutes. Did we miss something you'd really like to say? No, but I'll just, just to expand, just to go back, that I, what you were just saying there, um, that's how the wasteland gets restored, of course. Yeah, it, absolutely. It, yeah. Absolutely. I, I've had that uh, that kind of an inner experience in my own life, you know, where the wasteland uh, was completely transformed. Yes. You know, completely. And I, and I didn't even know the wasteland existed until that point. Yes. You know, it's very powerful. Listen, you get to your, your new book done, you get it out there, uh, contact us. We'd like, love to have you back on the show. I will do that. And, Thank uh, you. And we'll, yes. we'll see if we can't uh, help you get the word out on that book. Thank you. I, I've really enjoyed our conversation. Thank Me you too. for taking your time tonight. And yeah. uh, sometime, if you're you're in this area, you get down towards sunny Florida here. You know, contact me. We'll have coffee. We'll talk. Whatever. Oh, I'd love to. Okay, I'll do that. Thank you. Please do. And uh, you have a good night. And you. Okay. Thanks, Diana. Thanks. Thanks. Bye. Bye now. Well, that, Diana was a, a great guest. Uh, just, you know, when you look at the book, it's a pretty thick book, and there was so much that we could talk about here. Uh, you know, we could have a series of shows on this, and uh, there's uh, so much benefit to, uh, to the myth that encompasses uh, uh, King Arthur and King Arthur's court. So uh, be sure to uh, uh, tune us in next week, 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. i got a great guest lined up for next week. And in the meantime, don't forget to accentuate the positive and have a fantastic week. Good evening. Welcome to the Spiritual But Not Religious Show. I'm your host, George Lewis. We have a great guest tonight with a really super topic that speaks to every one of us and has a message of uh, real transformation in, in, in ways that all of us. Uh, I'm sure you're going to enjoy it. Before I talk more about my guest, let me tell you a little bit about the Spiritual But Not Religious show and the Spiritual Broadcasting Network. We've uh, recently moved into a new studio. Uh, we're here in Sarasota, Florida. If you're familiar with Sarasota, we're on the corner of Osprey and uh, Siesta Drive. Siesta goes right out to the beaches. We've got uh, 